for the city of Tacoma. And that plan also will affect uh, this region, and it does affect the world. So, so uh, consider that, and you need to sign up. Uh, several of you uh, mentioned to me that you want to get water baptized. Please make sure you mark that on the cards. We're trying, to, we're trying to get a list of how many people. And we normally do our water baptism connected with our 101 class, Discovering God's Family. So that will be coming up uh, at the end of summer. Amen. It's going to be good together. So uh, how many are anticipating a, a f this fall there's going to be new families coming? Uh, uh, all sorts. And uh, you have to be ready to give up your seat. Uh, and I know that that creates a problem for a lot of people because you get, you get comfortable where you're at. And I'm, re I'm really praying, God, our room is just so small. Uh, uh, all I know how to do is to go to double services, you know, two services. I really don't want to do that because I love to be together. I've been in churches where you have multiple services before, and what happens is you, you connect with certain people, that, but there's other people that you never see because they're in another service, amen? And, uh, and so I don't like that because we're better together, you know, but, uh, but just be praying with us that we won't miss the strategy that God has for us as a body of believers, amen? This morning, I want to talk with you about identity, your identity. And I would ask you the question, do you know who you really are? As you look at the story of the prodigal son, you know, uh, he made a lot of mistakes, didn't he, the son? And he ended up in the pig pen. But then he woke up and he came to his right mind. And he remembered who his father was. Look at this verse, Luke 15, 17. It says, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And here I am perishing with hunger. You see, his job was to feed the pigs, but no one gave him any food to eat. You catching that? See, the food that he received was for the pigs. It wasn't for him. It wasn't his portion. So how did he end up there feeding the pigs? It wasn't because he lost his money. It's because he lost his identity. Say identity. See, brothers and sisters, you're, how many are part of the body of Christ this morning? See, you're supposed to eat with the flock. You're the body. You're not supposed to be eating with the pigs. Come on, get this. You're a son. You're a daughter of the Most High God. So something happened in this young man's heart. What happened is covetousness entered in. It's a big word. The desire for other things. The desire for a better life. And this desire so gripped him, it caused him to lose his identity. Do you realize this morning you're surrounded by a culture that demands your attention? And they're trying to tell you all the time, you need what I have. You need this. Hallelujah. They either try to make you feel guilty or make you fearful so that you'll get what they have. How many know what I'm talking about? If you, you need this, if I only get this, then my life will be better. But once you start down that road, once you start down that way of thinking, what are you doing? You're losing your identity. God has given you as body, members of the body authority this morning. Remember, Jesus taught to his disciples, and in Luke 12, he says, Take heed. That means pay attention. Wake up, take heed, and beware of what? Covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. See, life is not about what you have. The things that you possess does not create your identity. Write this down. Who you are determines what you have. Write it down. It's not going up on the screen. <laughs> Who you are determines what you have. You see, Satan is never interested in what you have. 
He only wants to make sure you don't know who you are. How many of you know you belong to Jesus this morning? Come on, lift your hand. How many of you know that God is your father this morning? <laughs> How many sons and daughters are here today? <laughs> My Jesus. You must know this. And you will never find your portion, what God has for you, by eating with the pigs. God has more for you than this. The last thing Jesus said to his church before he left, actually it wasn't the church yet, because the church wasn't birthed until the day of Pentecost. But the last thing he spoke before he ascended, we see it in Mark 16. Jesus said, go into... That can't be right. Just go to your family, just among yourselves. No, go into all the world, say all the world, and preach the gospel, the good news to every creature. Now, that word creature doesn't mean uh, armadillos. And, well, it's talking about every living human being. Everyone. Amen. And look what he says. He, we don't like this. This is not very American. But he who believes and is baptized will be saved. saved. And he who does not believe will be? Uh-oh. Are you a believer? If you're a believer, then this is your commission. This is our commission as a church. You see, who you are determines what you have. Amen? If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then new things attach themselves to you. You have new things. In fact, they, they follow you around. Look at the very next verse. He said to his believers, and these signs will what? Follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Hallelujah. That's what believers do. You start doing this, you know what's going to happen? Some people are going to get critical of you. If you actually do this, other people are going to get jealous of you. People that you thought you were your friends, when you start acting on God's word, all of a sudden they're not your friends anymore. They're jealous. And then other people will try to copy what you do. Why? Because of the results they see you getting. They don't have the heart, but they want the results that you're getting. Come on, is this good? But Jesus said that this is what believers will be doing. Amen. Now, you know the story in the book of Acts. Look at Acts 19. <clears throat> Very important. Look at this, what God says. says. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hand of Paul. Say unusual miracles. Then he d describes what it is. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now, no handkerchief has any magic power. But God will do unusual things to get people's attention, to get people who don't believe to start believing. See, most people in our culture today are put up with Christians. But they don't really believe that there's a living God that cares about them. And that if you believe that, then there's something wrong with you. You're mentally deranged. Is this okay? Can I be blunt with you? So God does unusual things to jar against that spirit of unbelief so that they'll begin to think, oh, how, how did that happen? Don't get don't You see... God wants every unbeliever to become a believer. For God so loved the world that he gave. Amen? So God will use whatever he puts in your hands to do unusual things. All you have to do is be believing God. Amen? 
Amen. Amen. So, so in this story, look at the very next verse. It says, uh, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. You see, everybody was using the name of Jesus, not just Paul. Why? Because they saw what Paul did, and they saw how it worked. Interesting thing about the seven sons of Sceva. See, Sceva would, would be like a pastor today. And so this pastor had seven sons. If you want to find a problem anywhere, just look at the PKs in the church. How many know what I'm talking about? They're not there because they're hungry for God. They're there because their dad has a calling on their life. Amen? Is this okay? Can I meddle a bit? So... <laughs> So these people were trying to use the name of Jesus because they saw Paul do it. But I want to encourage you this morning, church, the name of Jesus has no magic power. It's not a special incantation or a spell from a Disney movie that works. In fact, brothers and sisters, you don't have any supernatural power apart from Jesus. Amen? We must understand the reality of our life. You and I were born into a sin-filled world. You and I received the curse of sin. Amen? But Jesus came to remove that curse by being made a curse for us. Amen? Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for for us. How many believe that this morning? So in the midst of your imperfection, in the midst of your failure and the things that you just can't get right, God wants you to know he already died for that. And he wants you to put your trust and your faith in Jesus and not in your own ability. Amen. Put your faith in him. Put your faith in the one who died for you and just do this. Just turn from your sin. You see, the devil lies to you all the time and tells you, you can't get free from this. You can't get free. That sin that easily besets you, you'll always have that problem. Once a sinner, always a sinner. You realize there's psych books written today that tell you that? Whatever your sin is, you can never escape it. That's a lie of the devil. How many have discovered the, the, the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ who's transformed you, made you into a new creation? <laughs> but the devil comes to lie to people, doesn't he? But the power of the cross, the power of new creation, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the Word of God says that same power will raise you out from under the authority of sin and death. That means you have the ability to turn from sin. You can walk away from the devil. He's a liar. He has no power over you. Tell, say, turn to your neighbor and say, the devil is a liar. Come on, church. <laughs> Woo! It's the power of the Holy Ghost. The name of Jesus has no magic power. But when you surrender to him, when you turn from sin, when you receive Jesus as Lord and you give him ownership of your life, when you begin to think differently about who you are, something happens to you. You become a new creation and you receive a new identity. Now, all of a sudden, you're a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Hallelujah. You belong to Him, and He belongs to you. And because you have a relationship with Jesus, now you have the authority to use His name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whatever you desire, you speak in His name, and it shall be done. Hallelujah. In this story, you see these other men had no relationship with Jesus. They were still lost. In the devil's lies, in trespasses and sins. And they had ministry, but they were doing ministry through covetousness and jealousy and envy. What was lacking in their life was faith. There was no faith in their life. 
So in the story, look at verse, the very next verse, Acts 19.15. It says, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them. So they fled out of that house naked and wounded. You try to play with the devil apart from Jesus, you're going to get stripped bare and you're going to end up getting wounded. Most people in the world have a wounded heart because the devil has taken them out. Come on, church. But notice in this verse, that question. See, the demon never asks about what you have. The demon will always ask, who are you? And if you don't know who you are, you don't have any authority. I'm talking to you about your identity. Do you really know who you are this morning? You'll find this question throughout the Bible. David asks the very same question when he encountered Goliath as a young man. He turned to the members of the army and he said in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 26, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? See, the armies of Israel had given in to the spirit of fear. How many have had fear come into your life? You don't have to give in to it. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. But if you don't know that, fear will take you out. That's what happened to the army. Saul was comparing their weapons with the size of Goliath's weapons. Saul was looking at his ability, but David wasn't doing that. He was only concerned about his identity. David never looked at the size of the giant. He looked at his identity. Look at the question. He said, who is this? He knew who Goliath was better than Goliath did. He called him an uncircumcised Philistine. What does that mean? Goliath, I know who you are. And you know what? You don't have any covenant with the living God. I have a covenant with the living God, and you don't. David knew his identity. Now, Goliath taunted David, amen, but David knew who he was. And in verse 45 of 1 Samuel 17, it says, David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of of the Lord of hosts, hallelujah, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day, not tomorrow I'm going to go home and pray about it. No, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. You see, David wasn't just looking at Goliath. David was looking at the entire, entire army that was there. Look at the next verse. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. Brothers and sisters, I decree over you today, the battle is the Lord's, and God's going to give something new into our hands today in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, give Him a praise this morning. Give Him a praise this morning. I want you to know who you are. I want you to understand what God is doing. That God won a mighty victory that day, didn't he? And he won it because he had one man who knew his identity. One man that had relationship with God. One man that was willing to stand in the gap. See, brother, uh, 
Dr. Greg, he shared on this last week. You know, God, God always works through you, but not for you. Again, I, I, it's not going up on the screen. You better write it down. God always works through you, but not for you. Only the man and woman of faith will stand when everyone else is running. Come on. Only the believer will have signs following because everyone else is running away. Are you getting this? When the Goliath of your life comes, you're supposed to stand. And not just stand and put up with him. No, there's no tolerance in the kingdom. I had to say it. Is that all right? You see, your identity determines what you have. Whatever you have today is determined by your identity. Secondly, your identity determines the things you do. When the young man woke up, he decided, I can't, fix it. I can't feed the pigs anymore. I've got, to, I've got to go back to my father's house. I don't belong here. You see, when you know you are a believer, a whole new set of signs just start following you. Amen. Isn't this good? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, catch this. You do not create your own identity. Your identity always comes from your father. Your father is the source of your identity, not you. Got to remember the local church, the body of Christ, that's God's idea. Amen. And uh, God placed me here as, as father of this house. That wasn't my idea. That was his idea. It's not just a job uh, that I do, and when I'm done, I'm going to just walk away. I don't understand how pastors can walk away from their flock. I don't get that. So I'm, I'm a different kind I'm not a hireling. I'm, I'm the father of the house. Is that okay? Is that all right? See, identity comes from Jesus, not the things that you possess. So many Christians in this hour, they're bouncing from church to church, looking for a better place, more adv advantage where their ministry can be fulfilled. But in the process, they run, up, run around hurting one another, judging one another, elbowing people out of the way because they want their shot. If you move from church to church all the time, you've lost your identity. There's a better way to live. God's going to lead you, and he's going to go before you and make a way where there is no way. Just remain planted in the body of Christ where God planted you, and you watch what will happen as you do that. God is faithful. He's not a man that he would lie. How many know? That? See, the fa your father is the source of your identity. Not the church. Satan is never interested in what you have. Only in who you are. I love this. Even if you make a mistake, the Spirit of God never comes to intimidate you. It's not part of his nature. So don't be afraid. You don't have to hide. You don't have to pretend you're something you're not. But just recognize jealousy will come and try to take you out. Envy and covetousness will come to try to confuse your identity. But just remember this. God loves you. God loves you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you. He never will intimidate you. It's not what he does. And when you know who you are, the world will never intimidate you either. And just like David, the Spirit of God will rise up within you. You'll have wisdom, and the enemy that stands against you will be removed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, you know this is good. So in the prodigal son, let's go back to the story of the prodigal. When he remembered who he was, He returned to his father. Maybe you're here this morning and, 
and you feel that the devil's lied to you, I'm just too far out there. I can't return even though I want to. No, it's never too late to return. Amen? And so look at this story in Luke. Uh, when he returned to the father, it says, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. That sounds like repentance to me. What do you think? That sounds like confession. But notice what the father says. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. What was happening? If you understand the Middle Eastern culture, when the son returned, the father was giving him his identity. The identity of the father was being given back to him. In these three things, the robe, say the robe, the ring, and the shoes. Brothers and sisters, when you come to your senses, huh, aren't you glad you? When you come to your senses and wake up and give your life to Jesus, you know what the first thing he does? He gives you his robe of righteousness. <laughs> this morning, you must know that you are kings and priests of the living God. And as priests in this world, you get to present Jesus to humanity. You're a priest this morning. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. He gives you his robe. You walk in his righteousness, not your own, right? You see, your identity is tied to his righteousness, not yours. Look at 1 John 1.8. 1 John 1.8 says, look at this. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the what? Truth is not in us. You could preach on this, Joe. You could preach on this by all, just one verse. I thought, I thought that he forgave me of my sin. Well, he has. But if you think you don't have any sin, you're not thinking straight, are you? See, it's, it's not a question of sin. The issue in this verse is unconfessed sin. When you try to hide things, when it's unconfessed, then you can't apply his forgiveness to your life. Because that thing is still alive in you. How many know what I'm talking about? And so you prevent the process of, for, of forgiveness from working. Amen? You prevent it, not God. Amen? See, God gives you his robe of righteousness to wear in spite of your imperfection. You don't earn the robe to wear it. No, he gives you his robe as a free gift. So you're a priest, but you're also a king. Say king. As a king, there's a group of people you're supposed to serve. There's a nation that's accountable, that you're accountable for. There, there's something you're supposed to do. It's, it's not just a title. It's not just something to make you feel important. How many are getting this? We see in Romans chapter 5, Paul says, If by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more. Those who've received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness are going to reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. So only kings have the ability to reign. 
Jesus has already defeated every enemy you will ever face. They're a defeated foe. Say defeated foe. And what is God doing? He's taking you from eating with the pigs. He's taking you back as a son. And he wants to change your identity. Quit looking for the crumbs. You don't eat under the table. You're a king and a priest. You eat at the table this morning. Hallelujah. 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 You're not a slave. You are a son this morning. And God places his robe of righteousness upon you. Just lift your hands. Let him put that robe on you right now. Just dare to believe God. That's only one of three. The father also gave the son a ring. Say ring. When a person carries a ring... That ring represents authority. That was not the son's ring. It was the father's ring. It, it, it's sinking in. Just get that. The ring puts you in charge. Puts you in charge of what he has given to you. In other words, you have to take responsibility. But just remember, that's not your authority. It's his authority freely given to you. Because you're a son. Because you're a daughter. Oh, See, this world was made for you. God didn't make this world for himself. This world wasn't made for the devil and for his demons. It was made for you. But only the believer has figured this out. You get to rule and reign as kings in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Come on, lift your hands. Thank God today. Let that spirit of reigning come upon you. Hallelujah. Now, this authority that God has given you, how do you express it? Well, the best way you express the authority God has given you is through prayer. By praying. Look at this, Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43 says, Do not remember the former things. Brothers and sisters, I don't care how good it was or how bad it was in your past. The Spirit of God says, Do not remember the former things. Why? Because I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? He didn't say tomorrow. He says now. There's a new thing for you even this morning. God wants you to know that new thing. He wants you to forget about the old thing. How does it come? It will come to you as you pray. As you pray. As a king and a priest, God has given you authority. And you will find it in prayer. Why? God wants you to decree a new thing. You see it in prayer and then you walk it out. But you have to take your identity. You have to know who you are. You have to take charge of your world through the one, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God will strengthen you today to control and lead in your life in Jesus' mighty name. How many believe that? Don't be afraid. It's not your authority. It's his. Jesus uh, said through the Spirit of God in Jeremiah 33, Call to me. And I will answer you. Isn't that prayer? Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. There's a great and mighty thing God wants you to know. Know, ident know your identity given to you by your father. And once you got that, he places his ring on your finger. And if you will pray, God's going to answer you. He's going to answer you. But you got to take your place. 
There's an opportunity for each or every one of you. But for you to walk into that opportunity, your prayer contains the opportunity. You'll begin to see it first in prayer. And that'll change how you walk, where you go, who you talk with, where you invest. That was a $1,000 nugget for a few of you, I hope. Just let confidence of heaven. Don't be moved by fear. Be moved by faith. And just remember, you're not a slave. So God's given you his robe. He's given you his ring. And he's also given you his shoes. Shoes speak of destiny and speed. Look at uh, Ephesians 6.15. And having shod your feet... With the preparation of the gospel of peace. When you've got God's shoes on you, you can tread on serpents and scorpions. When you've got God's shoes on you, nothing can prevent you from moving forward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, God will always give opportunity to you in every season of your life. I don't care what season you're in. God's going to bless you anyway. He's going to do unusual miracles so that the name of Jesus will be exalted right here in Tacoma. What do you think, church? But I have to ask this question. How many wasted opportunities, wasted dreams, and visions have you overlooked? Take opportunity when it comes to you. Dr. Greg last week was talking about pursuing, overtaking, and recovering all. You see, put your shoes on. It's time to pursue. If you don't pursue, you might miss your opportunity. Take your place. Let God push you forward. Run. Have speed. Don't be, lethar don't be a lethargic American Christian. So many vibrant missionaries, they go on the mission field and they come back filled with fire to come back into a lethargic church and they get depressed and want to quit. Let's not be one of those. Let the fire of God fill you this morning. Hallelujah. Put on that robe of righteousness. Let the ring of His authority be on your hand and be walking in the shoes that God... And don't slow down. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to run. Come on, church. Hebrews, Hebrews 12, we're almost done. Hebrews 12, 1, it says, lay aside every weight. You can't run with weights on your feet. Lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us, what? Run with endurance or patience the race that is set before us. Hallelujah. We've been running here for 10 years and we're not tired. We're more strengthened today than when we started. We're more focused. We're more determined. We're seeing more clearly what God wants to do and it's time to run together. Come on church. <laughs> but you can't run without his shoes on your feet. Are you running the race tonight? Because if you're running, guess what's following you? Grace is going to follow you, and those signs are going to follow you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Are you running? Are you on, are you on fire? Don't worry about the, uh, the speed traps. You're going to go right through them in Jesus' name. You're not going to get a ticket. Don't delay. It's not too late for you. Simply wake up and be one who's running in this hour. Make the determination, I'm going to get there first. I'm going to get there first. I know pastor started this church, but I'm going to get there first. Pastor, pastor, just give me hilltop. I want hilltop. Begin to run. So you can't run until you know who you are. Know who you are this morning in Jesus' name. Every spirit of delay, every spirit of fear is broken this morning in Jesus' name. Just close your eyes and lift your hands to the Lord right now. I want you to, it's just, it's simple, but I want you to get your identity. Hallelujah. We come against the spirit of fear. Let the faith of God rise in you right now in Jesus' mighty name. Believe God, not the devil. Believe God, not the devil. Everybody, please stand for just a minute.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. This is good. Come on, church. Stay plugged in. I kind of gave you three messages this morning. I hope you just got what you needed today. Some of you are here today, and there's just some things in your life you need to confess. You need to speak them off your life because the devil has confused you, and it has put you in a place of being ineffective. And if you simply come to that place of confession, hallelujah, the desire for other things has been stealing your identity. Let that covetousness go. Jesus said, it's, it, it, your life is not made by those things. So some of you are here today, and, and you, you just need to start decreeing that new thing that you're getting in prayer. Some of you have taken your ring off. Put that ring back on your finger. It's not yours. It's the ring from Jesus, and he wants you to begin to rule and reign through him. Hallelujah. And some of you just simply need to take God at his word and begin to run. And pursue that thing before you in Jesus' name. So lift your, close your eyes. Just lift your hands all over this house. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. You're doing something amazing. Father God, whatever our hands find to do, you're going to bless it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. May the work of your hands, may the imagination of your heart be in an anointed imagination right now. Hallelujah. When you're wearing his robe, when you're wearing his ring, when you have his shoes on you, you're going to surprise people. You'll surprise other men, but no one will surprise you because you will know who you are. Hallelujah. Receive that right now. Just lift your hand and say, Father God, I receive your robe of righteousness. I receive your ring of authority. I receive your gospel shoes. I'm going to run in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. This morning, all the oppression is being lifted off of you right now. Re receive it. Receive it. All that oppression is going in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. You're going to be lifted out of your old life. There's something brand new. I want you to see it by the Spirit today. The oppression is gone. God is hearing your prayer, and He's answering you quickly in Jesus' mighty name. Wow. My Jesus. My Jesus, I love you. I know you are mine. For me, all the follies of sin, I Resign. Come on, quick, 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 quick. Receive. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art Thou. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus is now. If you've never received Jesus and given him ownership of your life, just lift your hands right now, right all over this house. Anyone, 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 anyone. God wants you to take charge of your life. It takes, it takes faith to do that. I don't know about you. I, I, I get fearful sometimes. But how many ready to take that step of faith and just take responsibility for your life? Lift your hands if that's you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all over this place. All over this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many are going to stay in that identity that God gives you and not be uh, intimidated when you make a mistake? That robe is not qualified only when you're walking perfectly. If you lifted your hands, I just want you to come up here. We're going to pray together as a family. Come on, church. Don't be afraid. Well, what will people think of me? Or they're going to think that you're in your right mind. That's what they're going to think. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Only one. There was about 20 hands that went up. Two. There we go. Jim and Shannon, can you help me up here? Three, four, five. Lord, we just love you today. We just love you today. Jim and Shannon uh, Thornton just did a great job of ministry Friday night. I just really love these young adults. 
and uh, they're filled with the Spirit of God. Go ahead and minister to these people as the Lord would allow you to, if that's okay. Anyone else? You got your shoes on your feet? Got your shoes on? Got your ring on? Got your robe on? Just checking, just checking, because we're going to start moving at light speed. Is that all right?